beginning the time and then uh, comes back for a talk. So it's a great day. Uh, so Aritra uh, did his uh, BSc undergrad from Presidency Physics from 2012 to 2015. And then he uh, went to University of Groningen, I don't know why, uh, <laughs> for, for a master. Uh, but uh, he must have done something uh, good because uh, since then he has done even better. <laughs> Um, so then he joined uh, Yale Astronomy as a PhD student, uh, and he graduated uh, earlier this year and is now uh, a, an LSST DA uh, Catalyst Fellow uh, at the University of Washington. Um, it's very difficult. I, I, we we're just discussing that uh, maybe next year, maybe later this year, sometime or will come back and give a proper full colloquium at, uh, and then I'll give a proper full introduction. It's very difficult to introduce or it's through, uh, uh, to my satisfaction uh, in, a, in, a, in a smaller venue. I, I have to give, essentially I have to give a small presentation to introduce uh, the issue to or it's through, but um, uh, I don't know, I, I, it's difficult. To, so the way to write recommendation later is not to say, too many adjectives, but to give stories. Uh, so, but that's what I'm missing. Today. I don't have too many stories to uh, summarize. But Aritra, so I'm giving some adjectives. So Aritra is probably even after he graduated in 2015. So it's been many years since then, and many students, many excellent students, have passed through these corridors uh, during some of, some of you are here uh, during this time. But even after so many years, I think it's appropriate to say that Aritra might be the most enterprising uh, and most resourceful uh, students who have gone through this in recent years. Uh, I think uh, faculty members uh, and uh, of course, many of his juniors and seniors, they went to him asking him questions about various things, be it uh, applying to grad school or be it some uh, how certain CROs want, uh, you know, have a particular way to uh, work in the, in the lab. So it's a very broad range of uh, expertise uh, that Aritra has. And I'll not uh, get it, I mean, Aritra, during his uh, years, he has continuously gotten various prizes and fellowships. I think some Dean's uh, Fellowship at Yale and he also got the APS Distinguished uh, Student. Uh, uh, so I, I, I don't want to list all those things. Uh, during his presidency years, although it was very difficult to do extracurricular academic things because there are always some exams or something this time or other, but he managed to do various other, I mean, various projects and such. Uh, at different places um, and different subjects. I think one of his uh, papers is, I think one of, I think it's the first paper, first journal paper in which Aritra is the author is on um, yes. nanomaterials. So, <laughs> so, so that, uh, that's, that's what, um, uh, that's one of the signatures. Uh, I think I'll uh, end by, I mean, I'll end the introduction by saying that for once this particular uh, name, Catalyst Fellow, doesn't fully apply to Aritra because as far as my knowledge of chemistry goes, catalysts um, takes, I mean, they facilitate an, you know, re reaction, which Aritra does, of course, but they uh, don't change in the process. But I have seen Aritra really change and grow while he facilitated his own research and other people's growth around him. And I would like to see him grow even more. And uh, as I said, come back for more and more talks with that. Satisfaction is getting longer. Just one line I have to add to just tell you that what is Aritra's, uh, you know, effect in presidency. So when we advertised this talk and it went to the website, our system administrator, Mr. Shonji Chagat, he said, ma'am, uh, this is Aritra Ghosh. Our student, that is like is a physics student. Oh, that's so wonderful. I mean, the, even the system administrator was so happy to know that Aritra is coming back and giving a talk at presidency. So that was his uh, aura. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Ethi and Arthi, for the introduction and inviting me to give the colloquium. I was a minute Bangladesh that would talk to obviously in the shade of but uh, sir, ma'am, Jabol and presidency, the money shop, I'm doing a shop institution. Ke, Describe for it. I'm school about Tam Taboran Bolshe. The only protect institution teach you at a contribution to get a change for a second. Presidency the Porta Porta Monaha base Dudu Tinted in his Jenashika at Tahochi, Tokonese, my Tokonjokon undergraduate Potam Dukaza Baroteka Porto Tokon Kihoi, Uthai, Mane, physics for a key Korazat, but physics for a possibility. But he Korazat, Akoki, or the Shady Puru Babatai Presidency the Shekai among Tokon. যারা শিক্ষক শিক্ষিকা যারা ছিলেন তখন তাদের থ্রু দিয়ে এই ব্যাপারটা বা এটলিস্ট ওই কনফিডেন্সটা আনা যে হ্যাঁ এরপর মানে আমরাও গিয়ে রিসার্চ করতে পারি বা করতে পারি এই সম্পূর্ণ ব্যাপারটাই আমার এখান থেকে শেখা আর তার সাথে আরেকটা ব্যাপার যে খুব মানে রিসোর্সের ব্যাপারটা হচ্ছে যেখানেই বিশ্বের যে কোনো ইউনিভার্সিটিতেই সবাই আরো রিসোর্সের জন্য চেষ্টা করছে সে যার 1 মিলিয়ন ডলারের ফান্ড সেও করছে তার 50 মিলিয়ন ডলারের ফান্ড সেও করছে সবাই আরেকটু রিসোর্সে into scrappy hoy of Halokach Koramas, scrappy hoy of that should not affect the outcome of the results. Irokum on a kitchen or precision, the Kashaka, Oi Shakanami Poregi, the Kensi, Jimon and on no money, Tadjon, no toshi, on no the initial Shevloku Kari, the Imane. Shade, I think, my Amar presidency take a power of Chevy's statements. The Shade of Bullet, it was talking subject as he talked that who be. Uh, Manek Kolokia Levon, uh, interruption at Jonova. Tai Jokon, uh, Aro Kono question thugbe. You can stop me and then ask me a question and I can explain and go for it. Evoni talk type to Shurutekami Avonbami set up for it. Shurutek is of the Machkan even a Shurukurba make the basic introduction there. That was Sheshkurbo scientific result. Tai Machkane on a genish Amra skip code. Tai Sheshop Kitama backup slide hand and Achi. Tai Kalu the Shesh of the Mono. My questions that you obviously ask me, I can explain that in more detail. So, uh, what I will be talking about is investigating galaxy morphology. Galaxy morphology means galaxy shape, size, uh, features, things like that. How you can uh, study them in large surveys using machine learning frameworks. This was the topic of my PhD. Uh, as Sir said, I just started at the University of Washington from 1st October. But I finished my PhD at Yale, and most of the work is based on what I did during my PhD. So let's start. First is why is galaxy morphology impressed? Like, right? uh, now galaxies come in a very wide variety of shapes and sizes. Okay? Uh, but you may ask a question: What does the morphology or the shape or size of a galaxy tell us about? So. Astronomers started studying galaxies outside our, like besides our own galaxy, and started like categorically and systematically classifying them in the mid 1900s. And once they started doing that, they soon realized that the morphology of a galaxy is connected to various other properties of the galaxy as well as that of the environment. For example, in 1958, Olmert found that these dominated galaxies tend to be more bluer and show lots of star formation. On the other hand, bulge dominated galaxies, that is, which are more like elliptical and don't have an extended disk, they have more redder stars and show little to no signs of star formation. At a similar time, uh, Dresler also found that morphology is correlated to the environment, the environmental density of the galaxy. And since then, astronomers have linked the morphology of galaxies to various other fundamental properties of the galaxy and that of the environment. And I won't have the time to go into all of this in detail. But the fact that is to take away from this slide is that all these correlations, the how morphology is correlated with these other factors, they have proven to be extremely powerful tools in investigating how galaxies form and evolve. Now, because I don't have time to explain each of these in a lot of detail, let me just take an example and explain that. So how is morphology connected to the larger history of a galaxy. So in this simulation, what you will see, we will see two disc-dominated galaxies merging with each other uh, on the left-hand side. Of you see two disks, they merge with each other, and this is a simulation, of course. And what you will see at the end of the process, the disks don't survive 
and you end up with a more elliptical looking lens. So what can I infer from this? If I see a current disk dominated galaxy, I can be pretty sure that it has not had a major merger in the recent past. Because if it had a major merger in the recent past, it would have been destroyed. The disk would have been destroyed and we would have ended up with something. On the other hand, if I see a bulk dominated galaxy, then there's a fair chance it might have had a major merger in the recent past. So the point I'm trying to make is just by looking at the morphology of the galaxy, you can figure out galaxies which have different merger histories and then try to trace out galaxies which have different evolutionary patterns. So essentially the morphology of a galaxy is not only interesting because it tells you the shape or the size of a galaxy, but it's also interesting because it tells you how the galaxy is evolving over time. Okay, so that's the primary take. The morphology is interesting to me, to our group, because of this specific reason. Okay, so hopefully that kind of I've established now why galaxy morphology is interesting. Okay. Now let's move on to the next step. As you all know, and this is a very overused term that uh, we are in some big data revolution and that there's a lot of data being generated or it will be generated over the next decade. But let me spend a few moments in order to establish that, that how does it look? How much more data is going to be generated? Let's quantify this, okay? Before quantifying, let's look at some images. So this is a semi-recent thing. This is, uh, many of you might know, this is one of the upcoming surveys, which, are, which is going to start in the next few years. It's called the Vera Rubin Observatory Legacy Survey of Space and Time. This telescope is being built in Chile. And this, uh, for reference, a human in this image would be uh, the size of this like guard ring. So that's the size. And the engineering marvel of this thing is this thing slew. So the entire slew is in 15 seconds. So this thing is slewing and scanning the sky. And what it will do is it will scan the southern, the entire southern sky every few nights, every two to three nights. It will take an image slew and take an image of the entire sky. And this has not been done before. We have not had, so this is the, the blue area and roughly would be the most viewed area by LSST. Right, so you can then count this. That this would be the entire field cover, right? And this tells you that we'll be able to image such a large portion of the entire universe that uh, we have not done before. And not only will be imaging it once, we'll be imaging it multiple times. It will be very good for studying things with value over time. Now, this is a ground-based survey, right? You cannot study everything with ground-based telescopes because why? That atmosphere is on, right? So we need to things, we need to send things up to space. So what I like to call the sister observatory of uh, Vera Rubin is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So this is a NASA mission. It's the next, so uh, as many of you might know, NASA every 10 years sets its priority and decides to build a new telescope. The last telescope launch was JWST. The next highest priority is Nancy Grace Roman. Nancy Grace Roman's mirrors were surprisingly donated by the Department of Defense to NASA when they were surprisingly found. Uh, we can talk about that story later. But uh, this image, what it will show you is how the Hubble field of view, so many of you have seen Hubble images. So this will show how the Hubble field of view, that is the portion of the sky that Hubble can image in one snapshot, how that compares to what Nancy Grace Roman would image in one snapshot. Okay, so that is to give you the difference. So this is uh, the field of view of Hubble. Okay, so this is one Hubble field of view. And then this is one Roman field of view. So it's one, it, just, just a single snapshot of Roman. The Hubble field of view is, the Roman field of view is 100 times larger than the Hubble. So just one snapshot has been 100 times. So this tells you, we just, these are two observatories. Along with that, there's Euclid, which is a European ESA led mission, and that has already been launched. ESA is already up in space. It's taking calibration images and it will soon take science images and it will be operation. So, this tells you that this is not something many people, when they used to say it, it's like, okay, big data, but how much big data? I think now we are in the serious risk where Roman is semi operational, will be up launched in the next five years, and Rubin will take commissioning images from the next summer. I think now we are at that position where people have been kind of trying to prepare for this amount of data, but I don't think unless you see the volumes, you don't really understand the real problems of dealing with so much data. 
Now let's talk about quantity parameters. Yes. So actually, like the angular resolution of these things are they all similar? Uh, Hubble and uh, Roman have very similar angular resolution. They're instrument wise, they're almost very similar, except the field of view. Uh, the angular resolution, of course, of the compare if you compare the ground based systems with the state based systems, the state based systems have roughly 10 times or somewhere between 10 times better angular resolution just because of that. Uh, the limitation in ground based telescopes, even when you correct with adaptive optics, is that much. So that's the uh, now let's talk about how much data, how much data will be generating in astronomy over the next year. So this plot is a few years old, uh, but essentially it shows you some surveys which currently exist and some surveys which are planned for the future. Okay, so x-axis and the y-axis is the uh, bytes of data generated every single night. So how much data will be collecting every night, and the y-axis is in logarithmic scale. Okay? So essentially, if I compare with SDSS, you know, one of the uh, current uh, Gen Z people will probably call it as the OG of astronomical <laughs> survey. <laughs> we'll be roughly producing 100 times more data every night. Now, if you allow me, this statement does not exactly infer from that, but allow me some latitude. And then I can argue that if I will produce 100 times more data every night, then what I need to do is if I want to keep my rate of scientific inferences the same, my algorithms need to speed up 100, right? If I want to properly, unless, or if you can hire 100 times more people, that's another solution, right? So this is the challenge. Now, in terms of morphology determination, that is determining the shapes and size of galaxies, I won't be talking about the alternatives a lot, but essentially there are two standard things which people do other than what I will show. The two standard things is one is of course, visual inspection, right? You can look at a galaxy and try to say what shape or size it has. And the second thing is this technique called fitting light profile. Now, since there's a whiteboard here, let me just explain what fitting light profile is. So let's say this is a certain galaxy, right? I'm just trying to fill that into a fire one. But if you try to analyze the light in the galaxy, you can just try to say this is the radius where this is the center of the galaxy. Okay. And you can just try to map out how much light is there at different radii. Okay. Uh, in terms of data, you will have some data points here, 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 and then you can try to fit a line. Okay. So the two alternatives to doing what I will show you, one is basically, you can think about very simple fitting light profiles or fitting lines, and the second is visual inspection. The question is, can you do this? Can you speed this up with light profile fitting tools? These are some state of the art light profile fitting tools, Galaxy Stack One or citizen science projects like Galaxy Zoo. So, Galaxy Zoo is a citizen science project primarily established uh, by Chris Lentot long back in the UK. So, started and it has grown much farther since then. It essentially tries to recruit uh, public members of the public in order to train them and in order to look at different types. My argument is even given that you are generating 100 times more data every day, it's unfeasible to try to do this even with either of those things. And I can, if you want to delete this later, we can talk more about that. And thus I think for morphology determination specifically, machine learning is not only an option, it is rather an asset. So we, are, we will kind of, even if we don't move to this, we'll be forced in the next few years to move to this. Okay. So this is establishment of why machine learning is needed in morphology. Now the promise of speed is with machine learning is something that is you do it every day, and which everyone is trying to sell. Machine learning is very fast. But the question is, is this the only thing that we get uh, when we move to machine learning? Is the promise of speed the only thing that we can better on when we use machine learning? And my argument to that question would be no, because what machine learning allows us to do is that moving to a new system and then building it from ground up allows us to make improvements on the standard techniques, which I just explained, which, have, which the standard techniques cannot do because you're building a new system, it allows you to make them even better. And one of the challenges that specifically exists in terms of morphology generation is the quantification of uncertainty, okay? Let's say you determine the radius of a galaxy to be five, uh, two kiloparsecs, okay? Now this, 
all of you are connected with physics. So you know that this cannot be a guaranteed measurement. There will be an uncertainty in the measurement. I won't go into the details, but light profile fitting techniques, visual inspection, of course, you cannot get any uncertainty, except if you image, if you show that same galaxy to a thousand people, you can take some yeah, quantification of the variation of that. Uh, here, in terms of uh, light profile fitting, they can, you can come up with analytical estimates of uncertainties. But unfortunately, for the light profile fitting tools, these uncertainties are not very good. Let me show you an example. So this paper came out in 2013. Uh, and this was done with all the Euclid simulated images. Euclid is the telescope approach as we mentioned. And what is this trying to show? Let me draw another plot uh, to show you what is this showing. This is this thing called percentile coverage problem. This will come back again. So let me explain that. So let's say you predict this is some value X uh, that you're trying to predict. And let's say this is the probability density function that you predict for the value x. Okay. Let's say you predict a value which looks like you predicted a Gaussian. Okay. Now, let's say the true value lies over here. You don't know the true value when you made the predictions, but after you made the predictions, I told you this is the true value. Now, because this is a Gaussian, let's say this is the one sigma width of the Gaussian. So every standard Gaussian has a width. Now, theoretically speaking, if you repeat this experiment many, 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 many times, what fraction of the time should this true value lie within the one sigma? 68. Right? 68 mm -hmm. Something else. So this, what I'm showing you, is essentially this exact same measurement done for a lot of different morphological parameters. The one sigma line theoretically should be over here. This is the orange dot in line. These are four state of the art light profile fitting tools. Some of them are Bayesian, some of them are non Bayesian. And these are the one sigma confidence intervals that they achieve uh, on the overall sample of galaxies. So this is all simulated Euclid galaxies. And as you can see, all of them under predict the amount of uncertainties that is there. The problem becomes even more apparent if I break this up. So this is for all galaxies. If I break galaxies up by brightness, uh, then these are the more brighter galaxies. These are the more fainter galaxies. And you can see the problem becomes even worse when you move to brighter galaxies. Here, it should be here and it's roughly over here. So essentially, light profile fitting tools severely underestimate their answer. So this, this, what we think is happening over here is they, these, uh, systems are estimating their uncertainties in a very crude way. Because these objects have are much more brighter, they have more photons. And so these seem to be operating under the assumption that just, or they seem to be predicting their uncertainties only by adjusting the number of photons. Which are. So for a very bright object, which has a lot of photons coming into the system and saying, oh, I'm very sure about the result. And for fainter objects, where it's not sure, it's uh, it's decreasing, it's predicting a lot of things. Now, that is indeed a component, right? Like if you have less data about something, you should be more uncertain. The problem is that's not the only kind of one. If you want to treat your uncertainties very carefully, you would have to kind of incorporate different kinds of uncertainties into your essay. And it's not, I don't think this is a theoretical challenge of why they can't do this. It's just that these algorithms, how they're implemented, they don't. But I don't think this is a theoretical limitation. If you really wanted to, there are ways you can do this. It's also a question of how extensive your calculation will be. Let's say you want to do an actual Bayesian approximation of this instead of trying to get a light profile. For a single galaxy, it would take you a few hours. Then if you try to do for a sample of a billion, just become a Question of this. So that is my pitch in order to why you know moving to machine learning gives us some advantages uh, for morphological information. Now let's move into a little bit of what the outline of this talk would be. So I will start with the fact that now using machine learning to determine the morphology of galaxies is not something which is new. It has been done for quite a while now. But in spite of having done that for quite a while, some key challenges have been. So first is the use of prepackaged tools. A lot of people have used tools which already exist, 
without being able to either custom design them or stress test them. Number two is the need for large pre-processed training sets. As you might know, all these algorithms need a lot of data in order to be trained. The problem is, if you're trying to train, let's say, for a new survey, like the Vader Rubin Observatory, the challenge is training data does not exist because we have, don't have the data. And even if the data, if it took the data on the first day, it will not be labels. We won't know what the things are. So it's impossible to use this for any kind of training. Next is in morphological estimation. There has been a lot of work in order to classify galaxies into different bins of morphology. Like let's say classifying cats and dogs. You're identifying different types of objects. But there has been very less work on parameter estimation directly in terms of morphology determination. That is predicting the values of certain parameters. As I said, robust estimation of uncertainty, that's a challenge irrespective of whether you're using machine learning or not. And then uh, often these algorithms are sensitive to specific data sets, and we would also want to reduce the impact of trial secondary launch. So, so what I will do is first I will outline uh, over the course of my PhD, our group worked on different algorithms which address these challenges. And then I will move to how using these frameworks. Uh, we developed a morphological catalog for the hyperspeed cancer, which is a different survey uh, where, you can, where we uh, came out with a structural parameter catalog of lots of galaxies, and also how that helped us answer uh, the question of how the radius of galaxies vary with the time. Okay, so that's the total outline. I will start with this so I'll first outline the tools we developed, and then I will move into the results. That's it. Okay. Uh, this is near a slide where you, I mean, before you get into setting here, we have a slide where you actually just have a simple statement of the issue that, you know, the spiral elliptical irregulars are not so easy to always just uh, look at, look by eye. No, I don't. I'm going to make an So the, the point that RC is trying to make is that even if you try to do visual inspection, the problem is often that even to a trained visual eye, it's not often a trivial matter to pick up different features in an image. It often depends on how many bands are available. It often depends on uh, Galaxy, who did a lot of research on it. It also depends on what color the image is shown to the human being. That often seems to matter as well. So it's uh, the need for machine learning, again, as RC is pointing out, is also necessitated by the fact that it's not trivial to even just look at Images. Well, so that's the I mean, a disk will look very different and different in So, what RC is saying is that I guess this thing, if it's like this, if you're looking at it from this, this is a disk analysis. It looks at you. If this is if this is the image that you're looking at, and then if it turns, then this is what you're looking at. You're looking at very different. And if you are an observer, you have no sense of what this is. You don't have any existence of 3D. Because within a galaxy, I cannot, which is light years away, I cannot run spectra on different stars and try to figure out information. This galaxy is very far away, you just have one shot. It's like this, it's like this. You have no way of telling the information as well, as well from a, just a visual inspection. So there are lots of host of other challenging things associated. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So uh, we have worked on three different algorithms. Uh, one is called Gamornet, which determines the classification of galaxies. Another is Gampen, which estimates Bayesian positives of different galaxies, that it predicts values and uncertainties. And we have another framework called PSFGAM, which makes the above two also work for AGN host galaxies, that is galaxies which have an active black hole. Uh, for today's talk, I will mostly be focusing on uh, Gampin, which is this framework which predicts values and uncertainties. But before we jump into all of this business into neural networks, uh, let me do a short demo. And some of you might have seen this demo already, so I apologize if you have. But this is a task. So all of you have a task. I will draw something on the whiteboard, and I will just draw it here because it's you know, the advantage of projecting on a whiteboard. I will draw something, and you will have twenty seconds to guess what I am drawing. Okay. So as soon as someone understands what I'm drawing, just shout. Okay. So your 20 seconds starts now. Ah. 
So it took you 10 seconds to realize that this is a bicycle. <laughs> now, all of you have seen bicycles in your life, many, many bicycles. And this is what a bicycle actually looks like, a very typical bicycle, this is what it looks like. In a typical bicycle, there is always, now what I drew is very different from that bicycle, right? We can all agree that I did not get all the connections right. In a typical bicycle, there is always, almost always, you will have the two wheels and you will at least have this back triangular structure, right? You'll have that typical back triangle. And then you will also need to have some connection between these two and you will have that one. This often depends on the design, how hard that is. But the other structures, are there in all bicycles. And you have seen many, many versions of bicycles. But in spite of me drawing a very bad bicycle, you were able to say, oh, that's a bicycle. Now, why, why did that happen? Why did not your brain go, oh, that's not a bicycle. That's something else. I won't call that a bicycle. So what happened is if you do this experiment with many people, this is what always happens. And so essentially what is happening is that the neural networks in your brain, how they work is as soon as they see some visual concepts, as soon as they see two circles connected by some lines, your brain goes, oh, that's a bicycle. That's how the neural networks in your brain work. And all we do in terms of building artificial neural networks is kind of repeating the same process. It's teaching these networks the process of how you can look at very simple objects and learn from them that this is a bicycle, this is something else. Let me try to get into the weeds of how this thing works by giving a slightly different example other than a bicycle. Actually, I was initially thinking a binary star. <laughs> <laughs> That's what your neural network is more pain now. Yeah, my neural network is I see the neural network is tuned in a different way. <laughs> so let's say, let's throw out the example of the bicycle. And let's say you're trying to identify a cat. Okay? You all agree this is the face of a cat. And you're trying to show this to a neural network, which is with predicts cat. That is the task at hand. Okay? Now, what, and this kind of people have figured out over time by looking at different things. How neural networks typically work is that they have these different layers. Okay? And each layer, what is happening, this is a convolutional neural network, and I can talk more about these. But essentially, what is happening in every different layer, you're trying to detect a different kind of feature in the image. So, how these detections work is the image of a cat. The first layer, typically in a neural network, the first few layers, Look for very simple shapes, edges, and lines. So it's looking for these very specific lines, edges, and things. Okay? Based on the presence of these lines and edges, it is then trying to decide, okay, based on the presence of these, can I infer the presence of an eye? Can I infer the presence of a nose? Can I infer the presence of an ear? And if all of these are true, it's saying a cat. So what is happening? We are looking for very simple features, and we are increasingly looking for more and more and more complicated features, and finally we are deciding it's a cat. In a more scientifically obscure way, people often call this hierarchical method of uh, either shape detection or style detection. But this is, at the heart of it, this is what it is. This is all that neural network is. So essentially, as I again said, this is the takeaway from the slide. You are trying to look for different patterns and you're moving from very simple shapes to more complicated shapes. Now let's take a look at how does a neural network try, how does it try to identify these different kinds of shapes? Let's say you have this image of a zero, okay? And you're trying to figure out in this neural network, in this image of a zero, where is a diagonal present? Like where is a right angle diagonal present in the zero, okay? Now, as you can see, because it's a right angle diagonal, the parts of the image where this is present the most is kind of this portion and this portion. Okay? This is where there is a right angle diagonal. And this, after running this through a neural network, this is a response map which it generated. Essentially, trying to figure out which portions of the image have that right angle diagonal. Brighter portions have it more. So as you can see, these are the same portions which are highlighted in that response. How does that happen? How do, how do we make that work? So how it works is essentially we take this single filter, we take this three by three pixel, and we slide it across this image like it is shown over there. 
And essentially, we are doing a convolutional operation. Many of you could have heard about matrix convolution or even in uh, astrophysics convolution, same convolution. So at the heart of it, it's a mathematical matrix multiplication, right? Because this is a bunch of numbers. This is an image. This is a bunch of numbers. It's an image. So all you are doing is essentially you're sliding that tiny window across and you're doing a matrix multiplication. And the entire thing, if you ever hear about a GPU and why GPUs are so useful in machine learning, they're useful just for the single purpose that they can do these matrix multiplication operations order of magnitude faster than us. That's all that is there. So if there's another takeaway from this slide is that machine learning is bas basically just fancy matrix multiplication. Okay. Now, the entire point of training a machine learning algorithm is in order for it to learn what are the features it needs to detect in an image. Okay. How do we do that? There can be many different ways of training a framework, but the most easy way I explained in this thing called supervised learning. And this image, this graph is, is pretty self-explanatory. So this machine is trying to learn uh, what are bananas and what are apples. This human shows an example. So a lot of apples, the machine asks, is this a banana? The human says, no, but this is an apple. It says, yes. So essentially you are showing the same image multiple times and that's why it knows it's an apple. Yes, so I don't know much about the convolution, but I know that uh, by the convolution, you can do the blurry effect or the edge detection of an image. So is this uh, blurry uh, or the edge detection or anything else which is doing it? So we do, and so the very early, so it, I know in convolutions, when you use it in a non-machine learning sense, you can study or try to find these solutions, right? You try to find an edge or anything. In a machine learning framework, it does all its things by the convolution. So it neither, not only does it do edge detection, but it does all the feature detections using concept. So it's doing edge detection in the very early layers, but as it moves into the more deeper layers, it's doing something more complex. Yes. So the sliding example which you give, like this is like this looks very similar to uh, like the mass filtering algorithms. That people use in data analysis, is it similar or is it like there is some fundamental difference in match I mean, if you go down to, I mean, the, the difference comes in how the frameworks are designed. So, match the basic operation of convolution might be very similar. But then, if you combine that with the fact that typically how we design the frameworks in a way where it's forced to look for more complicated features later on. That structure is a little bit different, right? But you're correct that the basic operation looks very similar, but there's difference in the broad thing, right? Any more questions? So just a comment. So there's also the nonlinear activation functions that make that make it not just a matrix multiplication, because you were to just multiply a bunch of matrices, you just all condense into one matrix, right? Yes. So it's not really, yeah, there's a little more to it. So yes. That's what yes. we love to learn. Uh, um, there is, uh, I won't be talking about yes. this at all, but there is, so another part of what makes these frameworks work is essentially you, uh, when you predict the output of a neural network, you have to give mathematical functions in order, let's say you have a neural network, which is coming like this, right? And this, this is the output. <laughs> now, how the neural network works is essentially you give it a bunch of value weights. This is W1, W2, W3. And then this is, let's say, a value x1, x2, x3. How this, the output of this is decided is just a, let's say, a vector multiplication, right? But then when this output comes over here, you, you typically use a mathematical function in order to predict what the y will be. So this value xw is fed to a function. It's typically, as I said, it's a nonlinear function. Different kinds of functions that you use, for example, you use something of max right? And then this is how it predicts, like what the output value should be. And we can talk at the end of the talk more on how these selection of these different activation functions can also affect your value. Okay. Uh, now let's move into the regime. Uh, so again, just to reiterate, how we train these neural networks is you just show it objects that you want for it to detect, and then it learns, and then you move on. 
<clears throat> now, the framework that I will be introducing today, so this is again the stadium of jump. Uh, trust me that I, I won't explain. So here is how it will work for this framework. I won't have enough time to go into the details, but I do have all the slides. So ask me at the end if you are more interested in the details. So this is the Gampel framework. And how it works is you first give it an input image. And then it first, using a spatial transformer network, it first props this input image to an optimal size. And then it uses a convolutional neural network to predict the joint posterior distribution of different parameters of this input size. I will be talking about these three specific parameters, the bulge to total light ratio, the effective ratio, and the flux. Now, the flux is just the total amount of lights that you're detecting in your detector for that specific galaxy. Radius tells you how, as the name suggests, how big the galaxy is. Bulge to total light ratio is a slightly more complicated parameter, mm -hmm. but often galaxies have these multiple components. It has a mass yes. and it has a bulge. The bulge to total light ratio, you're calculating what fraction of the light is in the disk and what fraction of the light is in the bulge. So essentially, it tells you how big the bulge is compared to the Oh, so, Aritra, uh, you said that from the first step to the second step, that's like you're saying it's an optimal size. Yes. How is that being decided? Like, what would be optimal? So, that is how, uh, why, let me, I skipped this slide in my presentation, but I will just, I will just explain to you in the next slide. Okay, sure, sure. So, essentially, uh, so what we're doing is this, essentially, the, another thing I mentioned is this is a rotation invariant frame. Now, machine learning networks, convolutional neural networks by design, are not rotational in way. They are translationally in way, right? So if I show an object over here, if I translate it over here, it should be able to detect. If I rotate it, typically they're not able to detect, but there's a very easy solution to it. You show rotated versions of images, and it's able to detect. But in order to demonstrate that these are indeed uh, rotationally invariant, what I'm showing it to you, what I did is, I replace the joint posterior distribution by marginalized yeah. posterior distribution. So I just integrate it over the other terms. And I just have these three parameters. And for this input galaxy, this, these are the predictions. These are the distributions predicting. The red line is the mode, the maximum predicted value of these distributions. Now what I will do is I'll rotate these images and then show you what the prediction is. So essentially, if I keep rotating these images, you can see the distribution does change, but change only very slightly. And the red line traces out the value of the predicted mode, and the value of the predicted mode does remain pretty stable in the other direction. This is just a demonstration that we do, and this is just an example of a test that I'm showing you. But we do a lot of rigorous stress testing of these frameworks in order to understand where it could be going wrong. Yes. Like to predict this. Uh, typically, in the versions of data that I work with, the flat fielding, the darks, that have already been taken care of by the telescope operator. So I am working with much, let's say, Proceed. already processed data. Yeah, but yes, you do have to plan. These images uh, that I'm showing are all flat fielded, they're all drizzled, they're running. So, so these are when you get the distribution. So that means, is this like a patient, like a Markov chain, or what, what, how do you get the distributions? Like, what is this is only for one galaxy, or what you are extracting yes, this yes. distribution? Yes. So we have to take a decision now in whether we want to learn more about the frameworks. And I think there's general interest in learning more about the frameworks. Would everyone agree? Yes. yes. Okay. Let me then just spend a little bit more time on the frameworks and we can skip uh, the last one. Okay. Uh, for that, I will have to just do this manually. Uh, okay. Let's what does see. it mean? I mean, what are you speaking and what are you, what, what are you so skipping I, and what are you... Technical what? Right. I was skipping the details of how the frameworks work, but if there's interest, I can show how these frameworks yeah, work. Yeah, so let's first... Uh, okay. Oh, I, yeah. I have to unskip all the slides. We can maybe go to, go to that later. Uh, let's skip maybe, this one up. Yeah, maybe let's report the flow of the talk and then we can discuss these things later. Sure. Because there will be a lot of discussion, right? I expect, yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's. 
Now I have a quick question. Yes. So the rotational invariance, it's not coming from the architecture itself, but yes. just by data augmentation. Yes. So yes. To rotate the data set of it. Yes. So uh, after your question is how that how is it able to do this? Essentially, we show it. Uh, we simulate a lot of images and show it the same galaxy in multiple orientations, so it will understand the system. This is just a demonstration of how the uh, the cropping uh, or not. And a demonstration of how the cropping works, but uh, it's an example of what shift that these galaxies are at. The outputs are able to always zoom in on the image at the center of uh, the galaxy. And just I can explain it in more detail at the end. But how we train these frameworks in order to show it what is an optimal crop? Uh, it's it's not that we show it an image and then we show it. Okay, this is an optimal crop. This is not how the networks learn. If you remember from the image, there are two networks which are chained together to one another. How we teach it is essentially we show it an image, we tell it the right answer, and we do this many, many, many times, right? And we tell it, make a crop which will help you, or make a transformation rather. We don't explicitly ask you to make a crop. We ask it, make a mathematical transformation that will help you to predict the right answer. So essentially, we train the two algorithms together in order to just predict the right answer. And the network, surprisingly, just as the humans would have done, or not surprisingly, it learns that, okay, this is the transformation that we want to make. And it's a crop. So essentially, it's learning just from the fact that making a crop is easy because then you get rid of these other kind of things that you're not. So what is that? The input image. This, uh, the this one. input image will contain only one galaxy or the entire frame? No. So, uh, the input image needs to be sent. So for this to work, it has to have one galaxy at the center. So the entire drizzle frame, you already need to have run the basic pipeline of detecting the sources and have the X and Y, four nets of it. Uh, there are other frameworks where if you give it an entire drizzle image, uh, it can do that for you, where it will just give you the output of the position. And the, but Yes, for this framework to work, we cannot just give it an entire frame and just tell it to do the detection. We will have to make cutouts, and each of those cutouts need to be centered on the galaxy. So you're making an attention mechanism almost. You're telling you it'll tell you what part of the image is most useful to itself. Yes, it's almost like, it's like making it's a, like an attention mechanism. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, now, for the above input frame, as I said, it crops out more secondary objects. Uh, and this just helps the downstream CNN focus on the object of interest. And the automatic cropping feature of Gambit, what it allows us to do is that if you apply it over a wide range of galaxies, very bright and very faint, then typically these galaxies vary in size a lot as well. So typically you can apply it to very small or very large galaxies and automatically crops it and makes it applicable to this wide variety of galaxies. Now, uh, next, let's, yes. Yes, yes. In the previous slide, uh, if, if we give the same input multiple times, does the optical sense like they are uh, selecting always the same or is it near the So the fact is whether if we give it the same image, whether it predicts the same crop or right? Yes. So the question is once the framework has been trained, yes. If you show the exact same image pixel to pixel, it will predict the exact same crop. But if you even change a few pixels here and there, it will predict not a very widely different crop, but it might be the same. Slightly different. If you rotate it again, it will predict a slightly different crop, just like the distribution, but it will roughly the same. Now let's come to the question of another problem that I had mentioned earlier on. The question of how do you train a new survey? Let's say you want to do this for the Vela Rubin Observatory survey. You want to train your framework. But you have no training data. How do you deal with that? So, how do you deal with the challenges? First, we make very uh, lots and lots of simulated galaxies. Since these simulations are very cheap to make, we don't make complicated hydrodynamical simulations. I'm talking about simple light profile simulations. I can make hundreds and thousands of these simulations for cheap. I make them, I take a framework which has not been trained, I train this on this simulation. <laughs> Then what I do is I take a very small number of real galaxies 
And then I fine tune this framework, which has been trained on the simulations. I fine tune it using real data and then end up on my finally trained. And then I process all the galaxies. Okay, so we are doing this two stage process training on simulations, fine tuning on real. So, Richard, yes. when you do the when you do it on the simulated galaxies, this is specific yeah. simulated uh, from the perspective of what where Ruby is supposed to see. Yes, that's right. right. Yes. So, the, um, so these simulations are then, soft simulation. Yes, as I as he is saying, uh, these are uh, these have the noise parameters. These have. These have the parameters of our target star. So, not group or where we just did for hydro So, uh, the data already exists. Yes. So, I will show it to you in a second. Uh, so, so, what we are able to do is training on simulations and then fine tuning on real data. It allows us to drastically reduce the amount of real data that we need for it. For this hyper supreme cam work, we are able to train the framework by using less than 1% of the total data set in order for that. Uh, and what this allows us to do is also just make the same network applicable to different surveys. What these simulations are specific to the survey, if you just make a general simulation without knowledge of data, you can do this initial training set. And then in the fine tuning, since you're showing it real images anyway, we learn the PSF and noise from that. So then the benefit of this two-step process, if you do slightly differently, it can also allow you to make the same network work on both. Yeah. These are 10 to the power five. These are even I can't see. <laughs> These are 10 to the power four. And this is 10 to the power six. So 100,000, 10,000 million. Uh, let's now move to, uh, so th these are actual images from the Hyper Supreme Camp Uh This is a primarily uh, National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, led survey. Uh, in order to just see how this survey is different from SDSS, this is the same image of the sky, image using uh, Hyper Supreme Camp on the right and SDSS on the left. And as you can see, what it allows us to do it allows us to see much more fainter objects and it allows us to see things more clearly because the scene is much better. So those are the two advantages. You're seeing more detail, you're seeing more fainter objects. <laughs> and what this image shows you, the orange histogram is uh, essentially the distribution of brightness of one of the, uh, what I would say, the most established structural parameter catalogs established using SDSS. This is the distribution of brightnesses. And the blue one is our catalog. Essentially, you're able to push down two, three, if I say this is kind of the, this is in logarithmic scale. So if I say this is the end or this is the end, you're able to push three mm -hmm. magnitudes more deeper. So this is uh, the distribution of all our objects that we are going to process. Uh, we have three different uh, redshift bins going from zero to 0 0.75. And we have about 8 million objects in total, 8 million individual galaxies. So what we do is first we do some checks in order to see whether framework is working or not, and how do we do it? Uh, these are just examples of outputs. So so we so we show it three different images. I'm just showing you examples of what the output parameters look like. They look like something to point out is we again you can ask me about it at the end, but we design the framework in a way so that the values it predicts are always physical. Let's say the bulge field of light ratio can only vary between zero and one, right? It's a ratio of a total value. It cannot be uh, negative or it cannot be more than one. And as you can see over here, this distribution, when the network predicts it, it is truncated at zero. And it's not like I have artificially chopped, so I have artificially <laughs> chopped this distribution over here. This is, the network does this automatically. And we do this, I can say we can do this by essentially tricks. We so when we show it the parameters, we show it in a long scale sometimes, we do other tricks in order to force it to create only the range that we want it. So this is again, just to show that we also verify that most of these distributions are unimodal, they look normal, they're not weird distributions. Um, and they also conform to the physical limits of each one. This is just for three random galaxies, right? But yes. The correlations are always negative between two parameters? Oh, uh, no, no, they're not. So some of these parameters are indeed correlated. And 
maybe I will show this slide at the end. What we do is essentially we are predicting, uh, I guess this is the unmatched thing. I did not tell you how we are predicting uncertainty. But what we're doing is we are predicting uh, the full covariance matrix, a three by three covariance matrix, that all the nine parameters, and we are predicting other kinds of things. So the covariance is accounted for. I'm already predicting that. And the posterior for most of the parameters. The posterior, so there are a couple of different things, right? This is not, uh, uh, there are many different types of approximate Bayesian computations you can do nowadays, which are, which totally does not involve the posterior in any way. You right? don't assume any posterior. For our work, we are assuming roughly gouging posteriors for one of our answers. I can talk more about the difference. But in order for our natural types of gouging, but we typically don't expect a completely different distribution like a log normal distribution. What are those like the low Z 30 arc second, this with Z 24 arc second? So, this is the size of the input uh, of the actual image. This is 24 arc second, uh, 30 arc second. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, why do we actually need these tricks to force the output values to be in the ring? Because if it's really learning the actual correlation between the input and output, mm -hmm. if it's really doing that, then it should not be necessary at all. No, so what happens typically is in the design of the network itself, and this again brings us back to the question of activation functions, right? In an activation function, you can ask the network, let's say this is a y, this is an x. There is no real bar on what the activation function can be. Uh, this is an activation which is often used for classification. But if you just use a linear or something, it can predict any real number, it can predict any value. So in the design of the network itself, there is no thing. The problem only happens at these edges for cases like this, right? If the Gaussian is like this, then the network, if you just teach it to predict normal Gaussians, if the true value is like this, it will predict something which goes like this. But the interesting thing is instead of predicting Y, you can do a very simple trick, right? If you instead of predicting Y, you predict log Y. Mm -hmm. And now log Y can only take real values, then automatically you have Kind of exclude that, excluded all of the uh, negative numbers. You cannot exclude the ones for that. We have to do another thing, but we don't do log. We do something slightly more complicated. So excluding some uh, parameter space is eta pure computation at all. Yes, you can say that. Yes. So essentially, and, and that again, that again is another, and you can almost treat this as a in some yeah. ways, this yeah. is a weak right. So this is just three random galaxies, right? But if I want to see how it's working on the entire data set, uh, calculate what fraction of the time the true value lies within certain inter. Now, one signal that you know you can. For all the one sigma two sigma, these dotted lines are where theoretically we should be, and this is where our calculated values are. Okay. This is for the lowest redshift, and this is for beta and high. As you can see, they remain pretty well calibrated throughout this. And I'm cheating slightly because I'm showing you averaged over all the three output parameters. If even if I showed it to you individually for each parameter. Our deviations are never more than 5%. So that's the upper limit of our deviation. 5% is the value of how deviant we are. Now let's go back to the old plot, which I've shown you at the beginning of the talk, right? So this is what the different other algorithms, right? Uh, this is overall, again, that on the Euclid simulation work. Um, this is where Gamble is this new orange histogram computation by about 15 to 60 percent. Now, uh, what do we do with this? Once we are sure that this framework is working properly, we process 
all the 8 million galaxies to this framework. And we end up with one of the largest structural parameter catalogs which exists. Uh, it's about three to four magnitudes deeper than comparable bulge disk decomposition catalogs, and it's about 10 times larger. It also has robust answer. Now, what are the science cases that you can do with such a catalog? There are many different things you choose to do. The only thing, and I won't talk too long, I'll maybe talk for five, ten more minutes. The only thing that we uh, do with that catalog is the first thing that we start. is the influence of agents on the structural parameter catalog that we develop, and then we correlate with these density measurements. So these are from the hypersupreme gas survey. I won't go into the details of how density is being measured, but these are large fields of the hypersupreme gas survey, and dark, uh, brighter colors in this region are showing you more galaxies and more galaxies. Galaxies are present in these regions. And then you can ask the areas of a galaxy connected to environments that do denser environments have larger or smaller galaxies? Very simple question. If you ask this question, interestingly, in contrast to the very well established morphology density relationship, where we know that denser regions have more bulge dominant galaxies, the correlation between size and environment, when you Count for mass. There are a couple of things, and very different. Densities have more massive galaxies. That is a known fact. Massive, more massive, so denser environments, more massive galaxies. More massive galaxies are also larger. Okay. So very trivially, denser environments should have larger. But of course, we don't want to ask the more corrected question. If I take two galaxies of the exact same mass in a denser environment and a less dense environment. Is there any size? So that is the question I ask. Okay, so I'm correcting for mass. That's what I want to say. Now, if you ask this question and look at studies which have been done over the last 10 years, an interesting thing happens. These are studies done over the last 10 years with very different kinds of surveys, telescopes. And the rightmost column shows you the correlations that people find. And as you can see, people find correlations all over the field. They find positive, negative, no correlations, all, all times of. Now you ask the question, why? Why is this the case? You start to get an answer when you try to look at the sample size that people have looked at, right? So these are typically in the thousands of galaxies. So you're looking at one patch of this guy. And, and, but size That's still like 100,000. So size is not the only, is not the only thing. Right. So what I do write why people have gotten all these conflicting results are small sizes, absence of real uncertainty estimates on these various measurements, not dramatic differences between samples, which people have often used in the same study. And these three points are very important given that radius is again primarily determined by size. There is a relationship called the size mass relationship, which dictates the size of the so if size is very already strongly correlated with mass, any relationship that exists with environment will be sedentary. And to study that, you need to have larger samples. And that's why our sample is kind of very well suited to study this thing, because we have such a large sample with robust uncertainty estimates, it's very kind of easy for us to study this thing. So what we do is we cross-match the two catalogs. This is just to show you a redshift mass distribution of where our sample is. I won't explain this, but you can try to kind of come up with these measurements of uh, what is the mass completeness of your sample. So essentially, tell what these lines are telling you is that I am confident that I have detected all galaxies which are more massive than these uh, black lines. Just focus on the black lines. Is that total mass or stellar mass? This is just stellar mass. So this is stellar mass completeness. So I am confident that at the highest stretches, I have measured galaxies up to 10 to the power 10 solar masses. And at the lowest redshift, about let's say 8.5 or 6 or 7. Okay, so that's my confidence. Now, what I what I measure, what I measure is essentially the sigma is telling you the density region of the environment. So this is a measurement of over density technically, 
But you can think negative numbers less than regions of the universe, positive numbers more than three. This is just a measurement of size. Okay. And what these lines are showing you essentially are two different mass ranges, how the size is that. And as you can see, and uh, just, and I can again talk about this more, but what is happening is in each of these points, there are many, many galaxies, right? Because what I've essentially done, I have figured out all the galaxies which are in this tiny, which is in this dense, dense regions of the universe. I have taken their radius. I have done a Bayesian computation. I have drawn samples from that, and then essentially come up with these error marks. So it's a Monte Carlo sampling, which is happening at the back end. I can explain more at the end. But essentially, we do this. And because we're doing that Monte Carlo sampling, we can ask the question. Uh, you just run a Spearman's rank correlation test and ask the question, can we reject the null hypothesis of null correlation with more than five sigma points? So it's a standard statistical test of correlation. When we ask that question, these blue tick marks are showing you where we can confirm the correlation with more than five sigma points. This red tick is showing you which is just on the borderline, so it's with just five sigma. And then everything else is where we cannot confirm that. Okay. So Overall, it seems that at lower redshifts, we can confirm the presence of this correlation. At higher redshifts, the correlation either becomes weaker or it disappears. So, is that you think the statistical thing, or is it is there physics involved with it that we don't see those kind of correlation with higher redshifts? So, that's is the million dollar yeah, question. No, question. No, what will be the sample size in this case? Yeah, three million galaxies. No, in, not all of them are the same. Oh, why are you not discarding there is uh, no correlation? Yeah. And why are you not seeing oh. some correlation? What is the sample size in the it's roughly the same? So we then it can't be less than we it. checked none of these points. Each of these points have on average, none of them have less than ten thousand. Oh, so then it's definitely I can't rule it fully. But that makes sense because the hierarchical margin also did not happen that much that they received of points. Yeah, it's 0.5 to 0.6, not far away from 0.5 to 0.6, not like very high density. So this effect, uh, we have scratched our heads for a very long time. Why this effect? There's, because typically, typically whenever I see a plot where between two panels, the answer is changing so much. If I was the referee, I was like, something is wrong with your picture. <laughs> So we have done a lot of testing and I won't go into the testing. So what we have essentially done is this is where I'm just plotting the radius, right? But what we do instead is instead of, I won't be showing those plots, but what we do is instead of plotting the radius, we calculate this other parameter called delta R, which is essentially the radius minus the average radius as a function of both stellar mass and bulge to total light ratio. So here are not only you accounting for stellar mass, but you're also accounting for the fact that the morphology of the galaxy changes with the size. And even when we predict this thing, we see a very similar. Mm -hmm. So we do see that this effect survives. Now, of course, the thing to remember, a few things to remember, mass completeness in these panels are higher than the mass completeness in this panel, right? Because of course, I'm using one second. As I push to higher and higher redshifts, my mass completeness is not as low as other time. But barring that, we are fairly confident that this stage, that this effect does indeed exist. But you see, measurement is difficult. Oh, the, the measurement of density. The x axis, the y axis we are talking about. But the yes. X -axis so the what RC is talking about is the measurement of density, and that might be the question which holds the answer, and also because density. And I did not talk about density at all because that's, uh, we essentially just rely on the hyperstream catalog. But it's also a question that some of these things will also probably change with the scale of this. So also that uh, you are fixing the mass, mass B. Mass. But they're not the same type of galaxy. Maybe some of them are star forming, some of them are non star forming. Can you make that differentiation between like way and can star forming? Those things are not there. No, we. So all point, of them are in this plot. Yeah. But we make plots also where everything is separate. So we make same plot only for star forming, same mm -hmm. plot only for quite set, same plot only for them. And the answers are slightly different. Which will actually make sense. That's why this is still in print. <laughs> <laughs>
So, so, uh, so the density you said these are measured by the hypersaturation counting. Yeah, these are these are the uh, these are essentially what these are and essentially they use of course because such a large number they are not spectroscopic measurements yeah. available. So essentially they just take slices. So each redshift slice, they take the slice. It's a very simple, they take a top hat distribution and then they just in that entire slice calculate the, the projected number of your galaxies and calculate the weight. Yeah, so so then the, the headers on the x axis that's coming from what this hyper supreme can yes. yes, and remarkably, all is in the minus two to two. I mean, region, all the proper oh, red shapes, or is it just because you are drawing it that you are you know putting the figure that way? But I mean, the x axis is always uh, within minus two to two, so I was wondering. Oh, that, that is that just the uh, these are where all, all their over density measurements are. Essentially, this is the region where it's spent. No, but I think what Shreya uh, is saying is for different redshift genes, the distribution could be slightly different. Yeah, yeah that's a very different. Yeah. No, no. The, the distribution of sigma yeah. for different redshift genes oh, would have been different. Be different because you know yeah. the universe is evolving. So if you maybe the redshift differences are not, I mean, 0.6 to 0.7, you start from 0.3, maybe Shreya. in that. Uh, the delta might not vary that much, yeah. So but I think there's like are indeed slight differences between so the number. If we make any more comment, we have you have you have to include us in that. <laughs> 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 so this is one way to investigate this. An alternative way to investigate this is to just look at the size mass because the size mass diagram is that uh, point into this is mass, this is size, this is the figure. <laughs> what I'm showing you is again the same plot, but then I have colored the galaxies in different environments with different colors. So these blue lines are the le least dense regions of the universe. These purple line, purple points are most dense. This is just the delta plot. So this is the deviation from the mean trend. And as you can see, again, we see the same effect that uh, denser regions have more larger okay. but we also see another that in the last few bins where the height redshift where i was saying that the correlations, the correlations don't exist they exist beyond this critical stellar mass there's a very high stellar mass beyond which we still see the presence of that correlation it's about uh 10 to the power 11 uh 2 times 10 to the power 11 that's why i like to think it and we checked specifically that even in that tail end of the distribution, we have enough statistics to present to confirm that correlation with more than my size. Now let's come to uh, what SSR was asking about, is what happens when we do this individually for this dominated star forming version of zero size. I'm not showing you all the plots because it's a very busy plot, but instead I'm just showing you the places where we can confirm the correlation and the places where we cannot confirm. General trend, if you look at the distribution, is the same. Lower redshifts, more confirmations, high redshifts, less confirmation. But there is an important difference which happens. If you look at these, especially these bulge dominated column and this quiescent column, and if you look at the massive end of this column, so essentially for more massive bulge dominated and quiescent galaxies, you see that that, that effect is present throughout pretty strong. Now let's come, let, let me just very quickly summarize what we found, right? So we found that the correlation is stronger at low redshifts, it disappears at high redshifts, but beyond the critical stellar mass of 10 to the power 11, and for massive bulge dominated of some systems, we still see that. Question is why? I'm an observational person, so I'm very satisfied with this, and I can just end the paper there. Thank you. <laughs> My job is over. But if you try to answer the question, why there is substantial disagreement uh, between these things, and this is something that we, Frank, and Posta, uh, many of you know. You should ask Posta. You have your mind from post talks, so okay. There are these, and the biggest thing is while doing the literature survey for this, what we found out is, of course, there is no agreement between what the people and simulations are predicting for these things. 
So let's try to establish what we expect from physics. So for this dominant analysis, what we know is theoretical studies say that the effective radius of a galaxy is connected to its trivial radius, so radial size called A. Some studies important. Some studies predict to this thing called assembly bias. Galaxies cluster when different. So this is just taken from a simulation. And what you can see these red dots and green dots, you can see they cluster differently. The red dots are clustered more strongly. These red dots are showing galaxies with higher speed okay? or halos with higher speed, not galaxies with higher speed. If I combine this thing, that if it is indeed true, and it's a big hit, this is indeed true, then if A is indeed positively correlated with halo spin, and we know this for a fact fairly strongly that halos with higher spin cluster motion. If we combine these two, then for this dominant of galaxies, this could be one of the explanations of why we see if you do if you take two galaxies of the same size mass, galaxies in the which could be slightly not so. Our primary argument is we see no trivial explanation and essentially very large comparative simulation studies need to be done in order to establish what is the actual cause. But I didn't want to end the talk without any possible explanation of this is why. <laughs> but this is it. What are bulk dominant galaxies? Why do we see the effect for bulk dominant galaxies? And why do we see this extent of the critical ceramics? Again, this is a shot in the dark, but this could be due to the varying prevalence of mergers. So what we know is that massive bulge dominated and quiescent systems, importantly for which the effect lasts throughout, science growth is dominated by mergers. And given, again, this is also a selective statement, only a few simulations have shown this, mergers are like more efficient in denser environments. And if this is indeed true, that mergers are more efficient in denser environments, then you could expect that because mergers are primarily controlling size, size growth in bulge dominant quiescent, this is why they grow quicker in denser environments. Um, and observed critical serum mass might also be okay. So that's all I had. So summary of primary results, I introduced some frameworks. I showed you kind of why they are different from other existing frameworks. And I ended with a kind of some of the details of what we have learned uh, with this primary network. And I will just show some collaborators and take questions. Okay, so there has been quite a few questions during the talk, but let's start with other questions. Okay, after yeah. So, uh, I'm very interested about the uncertainty quantification that you do. Typically, uh, people can even further break down this uncertainty into this aleatoric and epistemic uh, counter uh, components. Mm -hmm. so have you done that? And does it shed more light on the physics of the galaxy? Uh, yes and no. So, unfortunately, it does not shed any light, <laughs> more light on the physics. Uh, but we do. So let's just talk about this uncertainty. It took me two minutes because this is uh, many people might be wondering on this. So essentially, we try to uh, account for two types of uncertainties. One is an aleatoric uncertainty. So what is an aleatoric uncertainty? Aleatoric uncertainty is uncertainty which is associated with the noise in your images because your images have noise, right? So it's connected to that. So let's say you have this framework and you're trying to predict these those three parameters. Naturally, you might expect, okay. I will predict just these three parameters with a new one. What we do is we don't do that. What we do is we predict the essentially the parameters of a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And this is why the assumption of the Gaussian is coming. Uh, Cohen -Brothers. And so essentially we are predicting the mu and the full sigma of the multivariate Gaussian. And then the important you know, point, which uh, in case any of you end up doing this, right? What we found surprising is many people often what they do with this, especially this uh, uh, covariance matrix, is they approximate by only taking the uh, 
the diagonal elements and just making throwing away all the coverage. We found this probably made the biggest difference in our uh, catalog being very well calibrated. So essentially what we did is we predict the full vector of masses, we predict the full covariance matrix, but of course for a new galaxy, you don't know what the predicted covariance should be, right? So in order to do that, what we do is we have negative log-like local parameters as my training, as my loss function, which I'm trying to optimize. And through that, I get the aggregate order, right? So which is uncertainty in our images. But this is not the only kind of uncertainty, right? There is also epistemic uncertainty, which is essentially coming from the fact that the model that you have trained for prediction is not perfect. It is imperfect and it doesn't need to for that matter. What you need to do over there is do this, basically this approximate Bayesian computation where you're trying to, let's say you have this data set B, you're trying to train using it. You have these images X that you are predicting for, you're predicting this parameter Y. What you need to marginalize the work is the omegas. So essentially these are different versions of the same network that you could have trained, but you did not, right? This integral is intractable for most convolutional neural networks. So what you can do, there are many various methods available in order to estimate this integral. What we do is a very cheap approximation. This is called a Monte Carlo dropout technique. So it's one of the easiest things out there. There's much more mathematically rigorous ways to do this. But why do we choose Monte Carlo dropout? Because it just works less. So if our uncertainties were uncalibrated, we probably would have gone for it. What happens in Monte Carlo dropout is essentially you feed, once the network has been trained, you feed the same net, same image through the network multiple times. And each time you are turning off neurons in the network according to a Bernoulli distribution. Why a Bernoulli distribution? Because if you try to do this proof of what mathematical function you should use to drop neurons in order to approximate this integral, it's a Bernoulli distribution. So we take this and we pass the same image through the network multiple times, tune it slightly, and then each time we are doing a slightly different prediction, right? So essentially what is happening for every image, I'm predicting 1,000 different Gaussian distributions in a three cross three space. And from each of these Gaussians, I'm again drawing just one sample. So a combination of these techniques gives us gives me an estimate of both my aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty separately. But we have looked at trying to uh, see whether that can tell us more about the science thing after, but no, we have not been able to. So like a follow-up question is instead of using a Monte Carlo dropout, if you just use a Bayesian neural network, would that help or? I, I mean, the question is, um, now the Bayesian neural network definition is a, uh, little bit easy, right? Many people call this itself a Bayesian yeah, yeah. Now, what you can try to see whether you can use, now this thing has many different names now. Some people call this, um, I'm now completely blanking out on the names. Variational inference? Mm -hmm. We do variational inference. 